right, well, it really has been a long time since I have been with you. The last time I was with you was in November. You may know I missed our woven gathering in December. You may have heard I was pretty sick at the moment, and I'm so thankful for our team that hosted such a wonderful gathering in December, but it's so good to be back with you. And as I was praying about this whole new semester of woven, God just continued to impress upon me that February was going to be a little different, which February already is different, is it not? I mean, you learn the rhyme like 28 days clear and 29 days each leap year and Groundhog Day, like what is that? I mean, they even made the movie about it and it's the same day over and over. February is already weird, it's already different, so why not just embrace it and make things a little different here? And so as I was preparing, you know, if it's your first time at Woven, you may not know this, but if you've been, you certainly know that every month we have a Woven Woman of the Month. She's a woman in the Bible. She may or may not be assigned a name in the scriptures, but she's named and known by God seen and loved and called according to his purposes. And so we spend all month digging into her story and seeing how our stories connect to her story, seeing the story of God within her story that we can live into better together. But as I prayed and prepared for February, it was clear as day that our woven woman of the month needed to be us. Us. Did you hear me in the beginning introduce this, that, that we are living into the story of God. The Bible ends, the story doesn't. You and I are still living that story today. And I've realized that overall it seems that there's a, a mass sense of suffering right now, even if it's low grade. All of us are carrying so much that God never asked us to carry. He promised to carry us. And he wants to care for us as he carries us all the days of our lives. So I realize for me to do what he's called me to do for such a time as this, that is to love and serve you. I would be doing you a disservice if I jumped straight into a woman in the Bible and skipped right over your own storm and your own suffering. So I found it interesting that we were postponed a week because of a big storm. Because you see, storms and suffering is just part of life. Now, obviously, some storms are bigger than others, right? We've got rainstorms in the summer, people dance in the rain. I mean, I've never personally done it, but apparently it's a thing. <laughs> so those aren't too inconvenient. I mean, you get out of a pool, right? You don't want to get struck by lightning. Those are pretty minor. Then you've got, you know, bigger storms like last week where we've got to, you know, shelter in place, get all the groceries from the store, hopefully stay off the roads, postpone events but still manageable. Then you've got crazy big storms like a hurricane or a monsoon where we've got to evacuate. It's not even safe for us to be home. All, every one of those is a storm, different forms, varying intensity, but storms are still storms and they're just part of life. So is suffering. There are varying levels and forms and intensities of suffering, but at the end of the day, suffering is suffering, is it not? And it's just part of life. I once heard somebody say that all of us are either coming out of a storm, presently in one, or heading into one. And uh, I'm going to show you, I thought, how perfect. I follow this Instagram account that has a bunch of quotes from the late and great Baptist preacher, Charles Spurgeon. He's got a ton. He preached his face off. But uh, one of them was, God has had one son without sin, but he has never had one child without suffering. God has had one son without sin, but he has never had one child without suffering. None of us are immune to suffering. Not even Jesus was excluded from suffering. And he suffered for us, but he also suffers with us. You see, our God is a God of resurrection, but there's always a crucifixion that precedes the resurrection. There is pain and suffering that precedes our risen Savior. And he's with us in all of it. In the name of Jesus, our suffering is never wasted. The storm never has the last word. And so throughout the month of February, starting tonight, we're just getting the ball rolling tonight, but especially in bread groups, I pray that this is a safe space for you to be able to process where you are, where you've been over the last few months. Because I think as women, we don't have a ton of time to process, especially those of you who are moms. I'm not a mom. I'm an aunt. I have three nieces. And even that, it's clear. Boundaries are like non-existent. You don't have a single space that's yours. I mean, you're going to the bathroom and they're breaking down the door. I mean, 
I want to create a space for you. You come to Woven and you come to Thread Groups, and this is your time to process through what in the world is happening in my life right now. And not only that, we're not only addressing the storm and the suffering, we are adoring and acknowledging and admiring our strong savior who is with us in the storm and carries us through and sends us out to declare hope as bright lights in the darkness. He's with us always. And so this space is for you. And so woven for February is totally flipped. Usually, you know, it's story time. I'll read a woman's story from the Bible straight from the scriptures and then share some thoughts about it. So tonight I'm just going to get the ball rolling and hopefully lead by example, hopefully helping you feel free to do the very same thing that I'm about to do with you. And that's to share my story. And then I'll share thoughts about it. And interestingly enough, that's going to be from the word of God, which are words of truth and healing. He has something to say to us. So that's going to be the order of tonight. It's totally different. If it's your first time, come back. We'll be back into the regular rhythm in the future. If you've been before, I pray it's a breath of fresh air. So how did I land on this? Well, I had mentioned in December I uh, was sick. Uh, turns out I had COVID, like many of you have. That was my first bout. I'm pretty sure I had Delta. And I won't get into all the details of it, but um, I just plummeted and plummeted fast right after Thanksgiving. I lost my voice. It was gone for three and a half weeks. I uh, self-isolated at my parents for about three weeks. I mean, y'all, I'm an extrovert. Put a girl in a room by herself for three weeks, it's going to get dark regardless. But add on the fact that I've got new and worsening symptoms by the day. Um, nobody knows what's wrong with me for those first 10 days. My doctor was convinced it wasn't COVID. And uh, I, I, it just was, it was miserable. I was not sleeping. I wasn't able to sleep. I don't think I wanted to sleep. Every night was like a, a living nightmare. I'm just being honest. I um, would say, it knocked me out the entire month of December, from the end of November to the start of the new year. And I experienced more fear in the month of December than I have in my entire life of 32 years combined. I'm just being honest. Um, I do want to say before I move forward, this is just my story. So I'm not here to make any kind of political or scientific statement. I'm like one of the least political people you'll ever meet. So if you ever hear anything through that filter, please choose to remember this comment. That if I'm making a statement, it's about the great I am who is worthy of our praise. He's entirely faithful and he's my healer. So I'm here to declare that he is my healer and he is yours too. That's the only statement I'm making. So it was scary. It was hard. It was lonely. Um, when you can't even talk to other people, right? But not just that, staying up in the night, if you had it, you're just coughing, like literally like coughing up a lung, right? I mean, coughing to where you're choking, to where you can't breathe. So many nights I thought, Lord, are you bringing me home? Is this it? Sounds dramatic, but they were real thoughts. I'd already lost my smell and taste and was losing hearing like many of you, but one night I started to lose my vision and I was losing it so rapidly. Y'all, I don't even wear glasses. It was very strange. I started to lose my vision so rapidly one night that I honestly thought that I was going to go blind by morning. Seriously. I'm just letting you into how crazy these thoughts were in this space of isolation and sickness and sadness. And I didn't understand why this was happening. It caught me by surprise. It didn't catch God by surprise. But I'm like, Lord, I'm crying out for you to heal me. So many people are asking for you to heal me. They're asking me how I am. And I'm just telling them, uh, sorry, I'm only actually getting worse. And I don't know what's wrong. And nobody can heal me. I was utterly helpless dependent on other people to care for me. A few weeks in, I got hit with this terrible episode of food poisoning, which talk about kicking a girl when she's down. I already was having trouble breathing. By then, I think I was at the weakest point of my life. Y'all, it just was dark. I had a friend in that time who said, fear's a beast, and he's right. It is. I came back to my first night in Dallas on my own and was so afraid to fall asleep because I was having trouble breathing. That oxygen monitor became my best friend. And I thought, if I fall asleep, what if I don't wake up? And who's going to know? I'm just letting you in to say, y'all, I'm human, and this is what I went through. It's not the biggest storm I've ever been through by no means, but it was a storm, and it certainly was suffering. And all of you who were in conversation with me in that time know that I was suffering. And so when I went for my follow-up appointment with my doctor, she said a few things. She said, of all their vaccinated patients, I had the worst case of COVID. It hit me the hardest for their whole practice. 
She said, it's like I wasn't even vaccinated. I'm telling my dad about this on Christmas Eve, which you should know about my dad. He's the strongest, most reasonable man I know. He survived leukemia at 34. He's not super political. If he was, he'd lean more towards the right. I jokingly and lovingly say he's loving but not compassionate. That's not true, but it means when you're sick, you don't want to be around dad. You want to be around mom because dad's not going to baby you, right? Dad's not going to make a big deal out of nothing. I love him for that. So I'm talking to my dad on Christmas Eve. Finally, I have my voice back a little bit. I tell him what my doctor says, and I said, I'm so glad I am vaccinated because I think I'd be stuck in a hospital if I wasn't. To which my dad says, more than that, Meg, listening to you, I think it would have killed you. I mean, God provided the vaccine to save your life. No, that's not a political statement. But when my dad said that, he was dead serious. And immediately my perspective switched. Because that whole month, all I had felt was sadness. And asking God, why? How long, O oh Lord? And in that moment, I shifted to gratitude and praise. God, thank you that I'm here. That I'm breathing. That my voice is back. I may be weak, but you're going to make me strong. And I'm more determined than ever to be strong. So I'm here to tell you, praise the Lord, I'm standing and talking to you today. Because my dad was dead serious. He would know I couldn't see myself. I was alone. But I was literally at my weakest. But God was with me through it all. And so coming out of that, I began to ask a question I wish I could say I asked sooner, but I hadn't. And it was this. God, what are you wanting to teach me through this? I'm still here. For what? Why? What are you wanting to show me? Because the truth of the matter is, in every season of our life, God is wanting to show us more of who he is. In every season of our life, suffering and storms most certainly included. He is always arming and equipping us for what's ahead that we do not see, but he does. And he's kind about it. And he's gracious about it. So I started to ask that question. So that's what we're doing tonight, right? We're going to, in this month, address the storm. Yes. Realize it. Some of us just need to pause and, and realize, oh my gosh, I've been carrying this huge weight. No wonder I feel so burdened. But don't stay there. Fix your eyes on our maker, our savior, our healer, who's with us. What does he want to show you and show through you? So I'm just going to share a few things he's been teaching me. I don't think I'm going to share anything particularly groundbreaking. But if it's an encouragement to you, and I pray that it is, I hope that you're encouraged to know that your story will be a blessing to somebody else, if mine could be too. And it will be. Because something happens when we hear one another's stories about God. We get to know God better. Because no matter what season you're in, our faith, by definition, grows in the family of God. We exist to be in these spaces of testimony. So one of the things I learned was, you know, that first night back in Dallas, I was afraid to fall asleep. The next day, my friend Christy came with the sweetest little care package. I met her outside my apartment, masked and distanced. But she asked me a question. She said, can I pray for you? Now that might sound really basic. But Christy prayed for me and I lost it. I was a mess, y'all. Because I can tell you in all that time that I was sick, over a month, Christy is the only person who prayed out loud for me to hear it. And when you've been stuck in sickness and isolation for so long, and you don't have a voice, and you're not talking to anybody, and you can't sleep, and fear just continues to grow and grow, for somebody to pray, not just period, but to pray with you and pray for you, and that be the loudest voice that you hear, I cannot express what a gift that was. So that's one of the first lessons I learned. I want to be like Christy. I'm not super goal-oriented. I don't do New Year's resolutions. I'm not real competitive. It drives my family nuts when we play games. I just enjoy the game and the company. But I have been seeking in 2022 to pray for somebody out loud every day. Now, some days I don't. Some days I get to do it a ton. But it's been such a good practice for me to look for opportunities to not just say, I'll pray for you, but hey, can I pray with you? You know, in my entire life and everywhere I've lived around the world, no one has ever rejected a request for me to pray for them. Not yet. I believe not ever. And it's a huge gift that all of us have to offer. Every one of us. Because when we call upon the name of the Lord Most High in prayer, he can do 
anything. Anything. To the one who is able to do far more exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we could ever ask or imagine according to his power at work within us. To him be the glory in the church in Christ Jesus our Lord forever and ever. Amen. He is able, but I wonder, do we believe that? And I got to be honest with you. I don't think we do. I think we read it. I think it sounds nice. But if we really believe that, wouldn't we pray so much more? And wouldn't we actually stop and pray for people so much more? The one who is able, I want to live in that space. We overthink this whole life um, of living this life of faith, walking in the way of Jesus. We make it way too complicated. Can I get an amen? Jesus would have stopped, looked, listened, called out, lifted up to God the Father, who can actually do something about it. He can actually do something about it, our healer. And he delights in our prayers. It's a tremendous gift to offer. We were made for that posture of prayer and and relationship. And so that started to show me that my physical condition was a picture of my spiritual condition that, y'all, I was not even aware of. Somehow, since I moved to Dallas, I didn't mean to. But I let good things become God things. I let really good people and projects occupy space that's reserved for God. Now, God's still on his throne, but he was no longer on the throne of my heart. And I admit to that, and I confess to that, that I tried to make my own way and do everything on my own to honor him and glorify him in these new relationships and new opportunities, beautiful things. But they're not God. And so this rot started to take place in my heart. And it left me spiritually exactly as I was physically, utterly helpless. Because I was striving, trying to do this on my own. I was never made to do that. I was made to depend on my maker, who kept me quiet for three and a half weeks where he was the only one who could hear me. I don't think that was accidental. And so I was joking with Cinnamon, she's here, uh, that I feel like God is doing a home reno of my heart. I don't know. Does anyone watch HGTV? Raise your hand if you do. Anyone? Yes, I'm in good company. Y'all, I love HGTV. I love the before and after, right? These homes that look totally hopeless, right? Just demolish them and start over. Until there's a designer. That designer hits the scene. They see that there is beautiful potential in that house that's been so abandoned and neglected. And once that designer gets to work, They tear it down to the studs, they rebuild and renovate. And it becomes more beautiful and strong than ever and a blessing to whoever inhabits it, but a blessing to the whole community. There's always that scene of neighbors enjoying the new home, isn't there? That's what God is doing in me right now, y'all. I'm not at the after, I'm past the before, but I'm in the middle and quite frankly, the middle is a mess. I'm just opening up to you. God is tearing me down to the studs in every way that you can imagine, but he's rebuilding. And I'm convinced that at the end of this, I'm going to be more beautiful and strong than ever to be a blessing, hopefully, to those who are around me. As he takes back his rightful place as my first love, as Lord of my life, no one and nothing should stand between that. Not for me, not for y'all. So we're in a home reno. So coming into this new year, I was praying and I was asking God for clarity. I don't know if you've done that before, but I was asking God for clarity. And you know what he keeps doing? I'm asking God for clarity and he keeps giving me curiosity. (laughs) I ask God for clarity, he keeps giving me curiosity, and I'm choosing to believe that's better. Here's why. Because when he gives me clarity, I have a habit of taking that clarity and running with it. And in so doing, leaving God behind. But when he gives me curiosity, what do I do? I press in. I draw near. I lean back, like we just sang. I draw close. Eyes fixed on my maker. I don't leave him behind. I'm moving forward with him. You see, I want him to show me more of where we're going. But he wants to show me more of who he is. Did you catch that? I know someone in this room needs to hear that tonight. I wanted him to show me more of where we're going, but he wants to show me more of who he is, and that's better. So much better. Because I don't want to go anywhere apart from him. 
He is the way maker we just sang about. I don't want to walk in any way apart from him. So as for clarity, he gives me curiosity and I'm choosing to believe that's better. A friend of mine shared this week that Mother Teresa was known for saying she never actually asked God for clarity because it would not require her to trust in him. I thought, okay, well, I guess I'm in good company. <laughs> it's not the first time. So I'm sure you too have probably received curiosity when you wanted clarity. I promise it's better. So there's a lot of lessons I've been learning, none of them groundbreaking. This week I realized, you know, I've just shared about a few things, but to be honest with you, the enemy's been trying to take me out left and right. What he doesn't realize is that actually gets me much more excited about what God's going to do, because otherwise I would not be worth his time. So dude needs to come up with a new tactic. But whatever, keep going. It's, it's easier to shake him off, shake him off. But um, from every, every direction, there's so much hurt right now, to be honest. And I realized earlier this week that because God's kind and he showed me, <laughs> Jesus is actually the only one who is presently aware of every single one of my present hurts. But more than that, Jesus is the only one who has been with me through every single hurt, sorrow, sadness, struggle, doubt, question, fear, disappointment, frustration, and joy in my entire life. And he always will be. He's been up with us every night. He's caught every single tear. Y'all, if that doesn't make me fall more in love with my maker, I don't know what will. That he knows the depths of us and still he loves us. So much he died for us while we were still sinners, while we were utterly helpless. There's not a greater love out there than that. He is worthy of being our first love. He is worthy of being on the throne of our hearts. He is worthy of whatever suffering comes our way. Because when suffering comes, and it does, and it will, and it is, I promise you, you will come out of that storm more in love with Jesus than when you came in. You will come out of that storm stronger than you were before because the power of God truly is perfected in our weakness. Now I know in the midst of the storm that we don't feel particularly strong as we're crying or I have those crazy thoughts and fears. I was literally at my weakest, but God took that moment and I believe he's making me stronger than ever, more in love with him than ever. So bring on the storms because I know the one who can calm the wind and the waves at the the sound of his voice. We don't need to fear. Would you believe every one of these storms, every bit of this suffering that I don't believe that God brings about but he allows is a test, to be honest. Not in a bad way. Y'all, I hated tests until I was in seminary, and it might sound weird, but I actually really enjoyed tests in seminary because they weren't dumb. They weren't for nothing. I had great professors who really desired for me to learn and to shine, and so every one of my exams was an opportunity for me to show what I've learned, but to learn more in the process, to become more confident, to become more bold in my understanding. And so these seasons of suffering and of storms, no matter the intensity, are an opportunity for us to choose to declare that, God, you're over and above it all. God, you're worthy and you're faithful. These tests are not for nothing. At least for me, they make me fall more in love with God than ever. And to me, that's worth it. There's no place I'd rather be than that. So those are just a few stories. Like I said, nothing quite groundbreaking, but just a few things I'm learning. But the thoughts about my stories we're going to find in Romans chapter 5. Usually we have a story. This would be more of a passage, but man, it's a good one. The whole book of Romans is phenomenal. But Romans chapter 5 will be in the first 11 verses all this month. So if you have a bookmark on your table, which you should, go ahead and stick that in Romans 5 and come back and come back and come back all month long in the presence of our maker and watch and see what he illuminates for you from this word of truth. It's powerful. So let's see what he says. Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, 
has done for us because of our faith. Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials for we know that they help us develop endurance and endurance develops strength of character and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment. For we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son, while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord, Jesus Christ, has made us friends of God. Amen. It's good news. I can't wait for you to dig into that all this month in the presence of God and in your thread groups. I just want to say briefly, my favorite thing in this, besides obviously verse 8 is one of my life verses, right? But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. But 5.1 is so strong when it says we have peace with God. Why? Because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. We have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. Sis, what are you carrying? He never asked you to carry. He promised to carry you. And he wants to care for you as he does. The only thing he asked us to do is to cast our cares upon him. He wants it. Isn't it bizarre? He actually delights in us pouring out this weight to him because he's the only one who can handle it. So my question for you tonight is the same as it is every month. It's usually how do you see your story in this woman's story? So to be honest, it's how do you see your story in my story? Not about me. It's never about the woman that we're reading about. It's always about Jesus. I hope you've got that. So I pray the same is true when you hear my story. I certainly did not want to come up here and you just hear about me. If that's all you've heard, Lord Jesus, would you change it in this moment? Because I want you to hear him. I want you to see him in your own life too. So in the next 10 minutes, y'all, just talk around your tables. If there's no one at your table, I encourage you to find somebody, talk, and say, how do you see your story and my story? And then I'll wrap us up.